Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is the 102nd episode of the Royal Society of Medicine COVID-19 series. My name is Dr. Laura Benjamin. Um, I'm a principal research fellow at UCL and a consultant stroke neurologist at Queen Square London. I'll be chairing this session. So today we plan to present the neuropsychiatric effects and the neurological complications of COVID-19 on the brain. We have two distinguished speakers who've, who've immersed themselves in this topic and leading some of the largest um, studies in this field globally. Firstly, Dr. Benedict Michael, who's a reader and an MRC and scientist at University of Liverpool and an honorary consultant neurologist at the Walton Centre. And Dr. Tim Nicholson um, is a consultant neuropsychiatrist um, consultant psychiatrist and a clinical lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College. They'll both speak for 15 minutes and a five minute Q&A after each talk. Um, so uh, let's begin. Um, over to you, Dr. Michael. Great. Thanks, Dr. Benjamin. That's great. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to, uh, to virtually be with you uh, to present some of the work that we've been doing in this in this field. And I'm going to be talking about the neurological aspects and Dr. Nicholson about the more neuropsychiatric aspects. Um, I always begin with this slide, as I have been doing since March 2020. Uh, this is Konstantin von Economo, who did fa foundational work about the effects on the brain uh, during the uh, Spanish flu uh, pandemic back in the early 1900s. And I, I bring it up because I think, uh, like his work, much of our work uh, has raised more questions than it's answered, but I hope it will be of interest to this broad audience. Now, very early on in the pandemic, it became apparent that maybe 70 to 80 percent of people hospitalized with COVID-19 had some sort of neurological symptoms like headache or muscle pain. Maybe up to 10 percent had a clear neurological syndrome like a delirium or encephalopathy. And maybe up to 1 percent had a diagnosis like a stroke. And it's been very unclear, particularly early on, to what extent this might be the virus in the brain or the virus affecting blood vessels or the barrier between blood vessels and the brain, or something to do with the immune response, whether it was cytokines or whether it was antibodies. So when one thinks about any bug and its effects on the nervous system, we have to think about where we find the bug. You know, if we find the bug in a, in a non-sterile uh, space, like the throat, uh, it's not necessarily causative. If we find it in the brain or an immune response to it in the brain, then it's more likely that it's actually the pathogen that's causing the brain problem. And beyond thinking about our individual patient, we can think about what's happening at a po population level. You know, there are some arguments for um, SARS-CoV-2 causing brain complications. It's certainly consistent. We've seen it in lots of different countries. It's certainly temporally uh, appropriate in that it happens often at or, at or around the time of COVID. It's plausible and it's coherent with what we know from other infections. But the arguments against it are the strength. Clearly, many, many millions of people have had COVID and haven't had a brain complication. It's also not specific to SARS-CoV-2. We've seen similar things previously. And there's not necessarily a biological gradient, by which I mean the severity of your COVID is not necessarily a proportionate to the severity of your brain complication. Very early in the pandemic, I was actually honored to be part of a, a team set up by really all the, the UK's major professional clinical neuroscience bodies for adult neurology, pediatric neurology, stroke, neuro ITU, and the Royal College of Psychiatry, uh, and many people. Uh, who helped us. We were a broad church and we got up and running quickly. Um, by February we had ethics, by March we had these notification platforms, by April we had data uh, and by May we were submitting our first paper, which meant we were actually able to capture cases here in red uh, at the same time as the first exponential phase of the wave of the pandemic. Um, we published these findings in the Lancet Psychiatry on the first 153 patients. And it gave us a broad understanding of what was going on, and these results have been replicated subsequently. So about half to two thirds of patients with a brain complication had had a stroke, maybe about a third had altered mental status. And this was really striking to us because this hadn't been recognized quite so much before. And what stood out was that while strokes were happening here in blue at all ages, they had a predominance in the older population, whereas neuropsychiatric manifestations, which Tim will talk about, uh, were often happening in younger people. And in our first cohort, about a quarter uh, were in their 20s, 30s and 40s. And what was interesting when we mapped cases of hospitalizations here in light grey uh, over the first wave of the pandemic against strokes here in dark black, we were hearing about a lot of strokes early on, which seemed to tail off as the first wave passed. And conversely, cases of altered mental status uh, were increasing over this time. And this really got us thinking, do, are we just thinking about the immune system or the virus 
and the antibodies, or could there be some aspects of the stress response to the pandemic? Uh, and uh, Tim will talk about more about that. But it was clear we really, need, really needed to go back to the doctors that had notified us of cases to understand what was really going on. So we went back to them and 267 responded and gave us detailed clinical data on each of the cases. It showed us that about a third were females, so predominance of males, about one in five were from black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. And interestingly, uh, near close to half were under the age of 60 and uh, COVID-19 was confirmed or probable by WHO criteria in the majority. We broke these cases down into whether they were central or peripheral. Uh, the vast majority were central, so affecting the brain or the spinal cord. And of those, again, the majority were cerebrovascular, but because we had detailed data, we were now able to break down these altered mental status cases into those that were inflammatory, those that were delirium, and those that were primary psychiatric disorders. When we think about the cerebrovascular cases, the majority were ischemic, so clots, but we also saw hemorrhages uh, and thrombosis in veins, and some of them were multifocal areas, which is unusual for a typical stroke. And when we think about the central cases, clearly some had inflammation in the spinal fluid or on the brain scan, and often with encephalitis, but there were these primary psychiatric disorders, um, some of which were new psychiatric disorders. And because we had detailed data, we could compare the onset of COVID to the onset of their brain complication. And here we see in days that the cerebrovascular cases, the strokes, tended to have their stroke at or around the time of COVID symptoms. And conversely, the central inflammatory, uh, psychiatric and peripheral cases were statistically significantly later, with an average time of onset of about two weeks after their COVID symptoms began. And crucially beyond this, about a quarter had their brain complication after their respiratory symptoms had improved, and actually a quarter had, had neurology that predated any respiratory symptoms. And it was these findings that would go on to inform the World Health Organization checklist. And this uh, importance of, of psychiatric manifestations and mental health uh, went on to inform the Academy of Medical Sciences, a progress and priorities report for mental health uh, research uh, in COVID-19. But I'd like to draw your attention really just to two groups because there's so much to cover, the cerebrovascular cases and these cases of severe encephalopathy, so severe brain dysfunction. Now these cases of encephalopathy wouldn't meet the delirium criteria that came out uh, late 2019 because they had a very severely reduced level of arousal. Some of them that was because they'd had a cardiac or a kidney complication, including cardiac arrests. But there was this group who'd had seizures either adults who had a pre-existing neurological condition who developed a seizure in the context of COVID, or this really interesting and troubling group, really, who had seizures and often prolonged seizures, status epilepticus, who were younger and were, were, had no pre-morbid conditions. They were otherwise previously well. And we didn't have MRI scans in our patients, but Jen Frontera's group in New York and Alessandro Padovani's group in Italy uh, did get MRI scans on lots of their patients. And they often found in these encephalopathic patients, this diffuse white matter change consistent with a leukoencephalopathy or very specific changes like acute necrotizing encephalopathy, which is a sort of brain death issue or acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis, uh, which is like a one-off hit of MS or limbic encephalitis, which is this uh, bright effect to the limbic system. Within the stroke patients, uh, we see lots of changes, often these large areas of infarct, and sometimes with actual break off and inflammation of the blood vessels and cells, here shown in this uh, picture by the arrows. And when we compared our uh, group of people who were under 60, uh, which made up 27% uh, to those that were over 60, um, they were less likely to have comorbidities, uh, and twice more likely to have multi-vessel disease and over twice more likely to have a clot somewhere else as well as in the brain. So that's a clot in the heart or a clot in the kidney or elsewhere. But really what we want to do is not just compare younger and older uh, COVID strokes. We want to compare COVID strokes to people who had had a stroke before COVID had happened. So we compared our cases to the national stroke audit cases from 2019. Uh, and what we found was have it, the COVID stroke cases were actually twice as likely, so 40 uh, cases as opposed to 20% uh, of cases um, were uh, under the age of 60. They often had thrombosis outside of the brain again in the lungs, the heart or the kidneys. But interestingly, many of them still, despite being younger, had conventional, often modifiable risk factors like high blood pressure, poorly controlled diabetes and atrial fibrillation and abnormal heart rhythm. 
but sometimes cases didn't fall into clear camps of of a stroke or uh, an encephalopathy and sometimes they had mixed things so mixed central and peripheral disease or they had uh, delirium plus a stroke or inflammation plus a stroke or they had stroke affecting a large vessel along with a hemorrhage and really what's important about these overlapping groups for want of a better term is that they were much more likely to require intensive care and ventilation and much more likely to have a worse outcome but despite this overall the singular biggest risk for a poor outcome uh, was pr uh, pr health uh, and age so the older people were in 10-year age groups uh, how frail they were prior to having covid uh, and perhaps their white cell count were the strongest predictors of having a poor outcome at the time of discharge from hospital. But clearly this is just uh, our UK experience. Uh, so we worked with colleagues to uh, do an, in, uh, an international um, individual patient data meta-analysis from 83 studies, including 31 unpublished studies at the time. And we had individual patient data for close to 2000 patients with COVID and acute neurological disorder from these places across the globe and here you see that if we don't focus just on those cases where we think that the brain complication is far beyond what we would expect but just any brain complication we now see that it's actually not strokes that are most common they made up about a quarter but half of the cases that were seen in this cohort had encephalopathy or delirium and because the delirium was such a large proportion of the patients, it's unsurprising that the vast majority had some respiratory symptoms prior to their neurology. Um, and about a third of them developing their neurological condition, uh, typically delirium after they've been admitted to hospital. Now with encephalopathy being uh, such an important problem, uh, it was it behoved us to get together and think about how people should best manage these patients. Uh, and I'm delighted to be co-director of the Global COVID Neuro Research Coalition, along with Andrea Winkler from Germany. Um, and we pulled together an international consortium of experts in various fields. And it was very clear to us that sometimes the brain dysfunction was primarily due to a systemic uh, pathophysiology like um, low blood oxygen, or electrolyte disturbance or organ dysfunction. But yet there was this separate group uh, that we had been focusing on in, in the UK where they'd had these inflammatory or, or blood vessel disorders uh, occurring despite them, the fact they often had quite mild systemic disease. Um, and then beyond this, we went on to produce uh, clinical consensus guidance uh, for the management of encephalopathy um, uh, with our partners from the, from the WHO. Um, and really this, uh, in simple terms, it breaks down all the things uh, doctors should look for outside of the brain uh, to explain encephalopathy or brain dysfunction. Uh, but if those things are not present, uh, it advises uh, doctors to look closely for what uh, conditions might be affecting the brain directly uh, that aren't manifestations of a systemic process, but rather a primary brain, dis brain disorder uh, and how one can go about treating those in the acute phase. But of course, the, the keen eyed of you will have seen that we had a paediatric group in our cohort. And indeed, when I helped lead the national surveillance study back during the H1N1 pandemic, the vast majority of, of the 25 cases we recruited uh, were children. So indeed, we, we focused with our colleagues in paediatrics on those patients. Uh, and of the many hundreds we've had in the UK and adults, there were only 52 children, uh, but about half of them uh, were, were brain complications directly, uh, and about half of them were this paediatric multi-system inflam multi inflammatory syndrome temporarily associated to COVID. So these are systemically unwell children who have a brain complication, and these are children who had a, a brain complication, even though they weren't that systemically perturbed. Um, uh, these are the sorts of conditions they had, ADEM and PRES and, and strokes. Uh, and of the direct brain problems, they were primarily inflammatory things, so optic neuritis, uh, transverse myelitis, so inflammation of the spinal cord, and inflammation of the limbic system, as I mentioned before. I talked about timing before, and the timing in the children was particularly interesting, because those that had a primary brain problem uh, were much more likely to be PCR positive, so have active infection at the time of their brain complication, oh, apologies, whereas those children that had a a, a multi-system disorder were less likely to be PCR positive and more likely to be antibody positive, suggesting that their brain complication is happening later, uh, suggesting the pathophysiology might be different. And these might be para-infectious so at the time of infection, and these might be post-infectious 
Uh, and what was crucial was when we looked at the hospitalization numbers, uh, as I said, about 1% of adults with a brain complication who are hospitalized uh, and nearly four times more likely for children. So maybe this is an underrepresented area we need to start looking at. And I hope I've convinced you that severe acute neurological complications are a real problem in hospitalized patients who've had COVID, often who are previously healthy, that the mechanisms are unresolved and the clinical biomarkers are undefined. And really, we must get at these underlying mechanisms if we're going to direct clinical management, because these people could have a lifelong brain uh, disorder and we don't want that disability. And that's why I'm delighted to be co-principal investigator with Jerome Breen on a £2.3 million study funded by the UKRI investigating the clinical characteristics, but crucially the underlying disease mechanisms of these complications, determining who's at risk and what the medium term sequelae are. Um, we're looking at biomarkers, we're looking at the pathogenesis, uh, we're looking at the role of injury markers affecting the brain, uh, and we're also comparing what's happening to these severely affected hospital patients who we need to focus on because we've got detailed clinical data and samples from the time of their, uh, their brain injury, and then comparing them to milder uh, cases who weren't hospitalized, but were nevertheless suffering symptoms in the community. And it's our, our hypothesis that if we combine markers of CNS inflammation, injury and genetic risk, we can identify mechanisms of these acute complications occurring at the time of COVID and their longer term sequelae, providing targets for therapy. We've developed a series of research tools which are freely available, including YouTube videos and a clinical examination which can be performed by not just non-neurologists but by non-clinicians and case definitions working with the World Federation of Neurology and the WHO uh, to validate this uh, in countries around the globe. We have an open access publication which has harmonized brain imaging across sites and across scanners, so, uh, which is open access so that other sites and other countries uh, can harmonize their imaging with ours so we can pool our data sets and work together globally. Um, we're looking obviously in humans is all I've talked about, um, but when we, with some, just some early data, uh, which I'll whiz through, is that the brain injury markers do seem to be elevated in people whose coma score is depressed. So particularly this neuronal uh, marker, which shows, shows neuronal injury in people with an abnormal coma score at the time of or after COVID. Uh, and we've also looked at inflammation markers. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but we're, we're looking at networks of these inflammation proteins and how they interact with brain injury markers and how they interact with each other. Um, and we've also developed models to allow us to look at this um, so we can uh, achieve infection in the lung, uh, but no active infection in the brain. Uh, but despite this, we see a degree of pathology in the lung, uh, and despite there being no virus here, there's no virus in this brain, and no replicating virus, we still see uh, immune activation in this model of the disease. So it's early days, but we're beginning to move forward in our understanding. So I'll draw this to a close, just to say that it's very clear that COVID-19 has a broad spectrum of neurological complications throughout the nervous system, particularly in people hospitalized with COVID. It affects adults and children. The nature of these and their outcomes vary by disease groups and by people's pre-COVID status. The pathophysi pathophysiology remains unclear, but the timing of the infection relative to the complication suggests there may be complications during the viremic phase, then a complication during the innate phase, and then a complication during the adaptive immune phase. Um, although there's going to be a degree of overlap, but we're getting closer. We hope that clinical data, biomarkers and imaging will allow us to stratify patients to either existing or novel therapeutic agents. But there remain many unanswered questions. But we hope with reverse translational modeling and also working together as we have done across the neurological and neuroscience specialties and working together as we have done uh, with our partners around the globe, we will finally be able to answer them. If you'd like to hear more, please do join us for a free, a free uh, Global Brain Health Clinical Exchange, which is a platform open to everyone. Uh, we usually have attendees from around the world and it's funded by the World Health Organization and the next one is on the 24th of June. I'd like to thank the team in my infection neuroscience lab. I'd like to thank all the people that do the work with me in other countries, everyone that's been recruiting children, everyone that's been recruiting adults, all our partners in the third sector, particularly our colleagues at the Encephalitis Society, and of course, uh, the coronary study group uh, with whom this whole thing began uh, what feels like a blink of an eye ago back in March 2020. And of course, thanks to you all for listening and to the RSM. Thank you. Excellent talk, um, Ben, as always.
impressive. And just the amount of work you've been doing over the last two and a half years to try and help us understand a bit more. And we've got lots of questions coming through. We might not be able to answer all of them, but Ben will try and type answer some of them if we don't get around to it. Um, so we've got questions on stroke and also venous thrombosis. So in the sense of venous thrombosis, what other risk factors and just genetic um, factors play a role? So I think we have a, a clearer handle on this when it comes to the very rare risk of venous thrombosis in uh, in the con context of the vaccine, actually. <clears throat> so we've seen uh, not the, the RNA vaccines, but some of the um, adenoviral vector vaccines can be sometimes, uh, rarely, fortunately, associated with a clot in the vein uh, in particularly younger women. Um, and that's in association with the development of this antibody uh, to a, a, a protein on platelets, an antibody against P4. Um, we're not we're not yet there in terms of what's happening uh, in humans, because unfortunately the post mortem data uh, is complicated by the fact that of course these patients have tragically died. Uh, so that the way their brain looks is not just due to the virus, but it's also due to lack of oxygen, due to mechanical ventilation, and and then of course tragically due to the consequences of dying. But there's some early suggestion that the virus can infect endothelial cells of blood vessels, and that might precipitate a coagulation cascade um, and that this is more common in people perhaps if they have high blood pressure, uncontrolled diabetes and other conventional risk factors for strokes. Great, thank you. Um, and I guess also the important thing is the risk is higher in people with COVID without vaccine. Um, Absolutely, it, it, yes. It's much more common in that sense. Yeah. Um, and there's a question about cardioembolic and atrial fibrillation. Um, is, is that the mechanism for stroke in, in COVID-19? It has been in a minority, but the vast majority actually haven't been in atrial fibrillation at the time of their stroke. Uh, the vast majority have, have just had a spontaneous uh, stroke. And, you know, of course, one does think it's going to be something affecting the endothelium and the coagulation cascade driven by inflammation and the virus in the endothelium, because we do get these unusual patterns, multifocal infarcts, the combination of multifocal infarcts and hemorrhage, and also some who have clear angiographic evidence of vasculitis. Yeah, but we don't think vasculitis is that common, though, do we? We think it's a rare thing in the yeah. conventional sense of vasculitis, where you see it on angiography, but low levels of inflammation of, the, of blood vessels is still under investigation. Yeah. yeah. OK, great. And then um, risk factors, vitamin D, medication. Um, are we seeing any links with that with neurological complications? Uh, we, we, we asked about medications. Unfortunately, it's one of those things on a case record form that's poorly completed. So we didn't, we weren't able to determine that in our data set. Um, and I haven't seen anything in the literature. I don't know if you, if you have, Laura, I haven't seen anything on vitamin D or, or other No, well, certainly not compelling enough yeah. to, 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 to voice. Um, and, and I guess this is a real comment in, with the study that you're leading, Ben, about encephalopathy in the community. Um, how are we going to address that component? Because it does exist and we, we, we do know that. Yes. I mean, one person's encephalopathy is another person's delirium, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, by the uh, national criteria, um, patients with people with delirium at the time of COVID-19 uh, ought to really be in hospital. Um, so I think it would be unusual for patients with frank delirium uh, not to have, have seen healthcare professionals in one way or another. And if, if they if they have, then we're hoping we pick them up as they were hospitalized. And that's that is distinct from uh, the, sim the subjective um, personal symptoms of uh, feeling cognitively slow, for example. Yeah, OK, thank you. And just lots of questions about um, presentations and references. And um, just to say that this will be um, put on YouTube and accessible to the public. So, um, yes, you should be able to get the references and the repeat presentation that way. Um, one last question for you very quickly. Um, can you, um, is there a long term effect on memory in COVID patients? We're looking at it. Okay, at brilliant. It. Watch, this, watch this space. The data came in last Friday. So, and everything that we produce, we, um, we make publicly available and open access wherever we can uh, and not behind fire, you know, paywalls. And also we will always tweet out uh, our, our most recent research. So um, just follow us if you'd like to know the latest. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, and I will pass on to your double act. Um, Dr. Timothy Nicholson. Thank you. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Sorry about the sirens. I'm, I'm presenting from clinic today. Uh, so I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. 
uh, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me to talk today about uh, brain effects and it's been a massive pleasure uh, working with um, uh, uh, Dr. Michael and the many other people you saw uh, in that uh, in his presentation. I'm just going to try and uh, put my presentation mode. Lovely, here we go. So um, I've got a huge amount to cover today, so I'll be rattling through stuff. I think it'd be hopefully more helpful to, to cover a lot of ground in small detail rather than focus on too many specific things. But I'll give a bit about the background of neuropsychiatry and other pandemics. I think it's informative. Uh, talk a bit about the data from the neuropsychiatry perspective about the work uh, that myself and many others have been doing with Ben and others. And again, it's been this huge sort of silver lining of of all this uh, that, that uh, we, we've managed to connect up neuroscience in a way that perhaps wasn't before. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about long COVID uh, as the sort of basic the, the era defining illness and, the, the, and this major neuro neurological and psychiatric uh, parts of that and then a bit about vaccine complications at the end as well. So um, just very briefly the background uh, as Ben alluded to we knew quite a lot from the Spanish flu uh, uh, about you know, the potential neurological, also psychiatric complications. And this is a sort of prescient paper that uh, Tom Pollack uh, and others uh, here at um, uh, the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's and others put together about what we know about uh, uh, schizophrenia and the Spanish flu. Uh, and just to flag up that uh, these complex neuropsychiatric disorders uh, were sort of thought to be the sort of encephalitis lethargic type picture, as well as sort of more discrete uh, psychiatric syndromes such as psychosis were occurring. Uh, so I think just to flag that up and, and, and there were some very astute observations and good data. Uh, and these are slides from Tom Pollock again, one of my colleagues. So uh, Carl Menninger really sort of found this sort of link between schizophrenia and flu. And, uh, and again, this sort of uh, old school paper here showing uh, delirium, dementia precox is the old term for schizophrenia, then other psychoses. And really this just shows that you get an initial delirium, the group one, perhaps later on in time, you might get uh, the group two. Uh, so really this sort of delirium initially, and then potentially later more complex uh, or uh, you know, primary psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia. So uh, the other uh, really amazing thing that some team uh, colleagues here led by Jonathan Rogers, was to put together what we knew about the other uh, severe coronaviruses. Um, and again, this has been sort of prescient in the sense that SARS and MERS, and you know, and what we've, this slide I haven't really changed for uh, since we started doing the work on this uh, uh, over two years ago. Um, and this is a really rapidly done uh, systematic review meta-analysis. And there was very, very little COVID-19 data back then, but the SARS and MERS data really found that these uh, conf initial confusion, delirium, insomnia, and then later, uh, psychiatric complications, PTSD and fatigue. Um, so uh, really interesting early data. So I won't cover this again, but we always had in mind with these, this, it's now looking back at it, how it all the data evolved where there was lots of interest in particular disorders. We were very much primed and thinking about complex neuropsychiatric disorders, such as encephalitis lethargica. Could we be seeing that catatonia, those sorts of things. We had to remain really uh, careful about not over-interpreting uh, the data as it came in and, you know, taking, you know, looking at everything, the, the small signals that emerged, but then, you know, being really cautious about, you know, association and causation and uh, reminding ourselves of the Bradford Hill criteria. Um, and then this first study that Ben's gone through, uh, just to focus on the psychiatry side of it. And again, it's just, you know, it's great that we all combined to do the same thing. And because of Ben and his team were so ahead of the game, we really, you know, uh, built on that, the sort of psychiatric reporting. And the, the initial data, and again, it's what's interesting is that even though this was in no way a epidemiological sample and far from it, it just relies on clinician reporting. It sort of stood the test of time in that these rough proportions uh, have really sort of stayed relatively similar. There's a lot of stroke, a lot of complex mental status changes in a mixed bag of a few other things really but from the psychiatric point of view we found some neurocognitive sort of what we call dementia like you know severe cognitive disorders psychosis and a mixed bag of other things really and as ben mentioned we then went on to do the more detailed case reports and uh, case report forms of what, what we found. And again, this is the big picture. Again, not very different from our initial sample of 153 in terms of the proportions. And just digging into the psychiatry, again, a sort of similar, you know, a fair bit of psychosis uh, and a mixed bag of some other things. Um, and this is how things fit together from that paper. And obviously we, we don't have the same mechanistic 
knowledge that neurologists have about dividing up our disorders according to mechanisms are limited to the simplistic uh, division by symptoms. So we're in this just little cluster of psychiatry, but there was a lot of concern from uh, delirium experts that perhaps we're missing, uh, misdiagnosing uh, 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 delirium as psychiatric disorders. But of course, most of the people reporting are fairly experienced clinicians, and this is the bread and butter of liaison or consultation psychiatry as it's known in, in the US. So just that's in a bit more detail. Uh, and the other thing, again, that neurologists have the, the, both the detailed knowledge of, uh, of mechanism, but also uh, discrete uh, categories of illness that we don't have, that, uh, that, that perhaps the shape of these plots about when the symptoms come on in order in relation to the COVID infection gives us some clue as to etiology, obviously, uh, you know, relative to the onset of the respiratory or other symptoms that they have. So this is sort of, you know, everything in psychiatry is bunched up in here, but you can imagine if we had enough data, we could sort of tease it apart into lots of similar plots that would give you a, a sort of bulge around the point where you've got a particular mechanism and later autoimmune effects, obviously. So the immune effect, the, the autoimmune effects would follow after the acute inflammatory responses. Uh, the other thing, it was a massive pleasure to put together something that we thought, because we knew this, this was rapidly emerging uh, data that was coming out. And there was no, you know, we know how long it takes, even with people working full time on doing systematic review and meta-analysis. So we set up this blog uh, and the JNMP uh, very kindly supported this. And a great team led by Matt Butler uh, and some others and a growing international team. We really synthesized all the data in a day. And we've actually now wound this down because we've moved past this initial in a rapid data accumulation phase. We're now moving to a, a sort of living narrative review that we'll be hopefully putting out soon. Uh, we also have some uh, our own uh, Twitter page, which is still going. And we did so we contributed on a, to monthly updates to the brain infections global webinars, which were all recorded, where we do five minute slides updating on the hot new papers of the last uh, few months. So just a few, I think, key papers to draw your attention to before I just give an overall summary of the neuropsychiatry. So again, this is a sort of brilliant paper led by Max Take, a, um, an academic trainee in psychiatry who um, uh, uh, had access to the a huge uh, electronic uh, uh, healthcare record data set in the US um, and looked at six month uh, neurological and psychiatric outcomes. And again, you'll remember, you know, you, uh, you'll see that, remember from what, we, what Ben's talked about and what the, 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 our data found from the coroner of studies that, you know, stroke, no surprise that that's raised um, reassuring um, uh, data about some things which there was initial concern. So, um, so he, they compared rates of this compared to uh, other infection controls so not 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 potent, no not a huge hazard ratio here for guillain barre syndrome. There's a lot of concern about that. Not much about Parkinson's and others. The thing that wasn't uh, reported in the paper uh, in terms of explanation was this: the, the biggest hazard ratio was for myoneural neural junctional muscle disease. Um, but together with some colleagues from the blog team and Dale Needham, uh, an in intensivist in, in uh, Johns Hopkins, um, we really conclude this is a slight artifact of having uh, uh, ICU. Um, uh, myopathies, so just a, a consequence of having sort of, you know, being in intensive care rather than a disease process other than the physical effects of being in, 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 uh, uh, in intensive care. Um, so uh, just whizzing back to this other slide, but just the, I think the thing the other thing to draw out is this, this risk uh, dementia here. So this is a reasonably significant hazard ratio. And I think this is something to keep an eye on because we know that delirium occurs uh, as a key feature of, uh, of, uh, of, of COVID initially. And we know that delirium is a risk factor so uh, for dementia, whether whether it accelerates or it's just a harbinger or as in, you know, you are, if you're in the pre-dementia state, then you're susceptible to delirium. But I think a lot, there's a lot of both of the, and a lot of evidence for both of those things. So I think we have to keep a close eye on whether there might be uh, we might be seeing. Uh, and, and obviously, this is what the epidemiologists and experts in dementia will be, will be trying to unravel. So um, there's another recent study here, a large, huge data set from the US, just showing, again, that these sort of uh, uh, big data, uh, um, sort of relatively reasonable uh, uh, sort of effect sizes here, but, uh, and, and, you know, good narrow uh, confidence intervals about, you know, this is only coarse data, no detail on the, uh, the subdivisions beyond this, unfortunately. Um, so the other thing we did as, the, as, the, as a group was did a, uh, a meta-analysis of, um, of all the neurological and psychiatric effects of COVID uh, as of uh, autumn uh, 2020. And obviously, those of you know, it's a big undertaking. And it was led by Jonathan Rogers, Cam Watson and uh, Ali Rooney here. 
Um, and this is really the headline that just puts together all the data we had at that point. Um, we, we, everyone, you know, these, these, these big meta-analyses take the steam out of you. It's a huge efforts. Um, but we really need to, you know, take this to the next level with international collaborations or getting people to enter data as they publish it so we can accumulate and synthesize data better. But this is the data as it was and no major surprises about the prevalence of these various uh, symptoms. So this is really a state of where we are. Ben's outlined the neurology. Um, that we know the stroke and the encephalitis, encephalopathy, but perhaps some other things we're still not sure. Delirium is the headline for neuropsychiatry. Thankfully, not much catatonia or complex neuropsychiatric deep brain disorders that we thought we might be seeing, but we definitely get cognitive dysfunction. Again, that's linked to the encephalitis uh, and whether that's going to develop in something else, we don't know. PTSD, very common in the pure, you know, the sort of pure psychiatry rather than neuropsychiatry and anxiety. And of course, so many different factors, whether it's biological or stress related to the pandemic. Not much of a signal for psychosis or OCD, but some there, but really not headline features. So this is, leads us on to long COVID. So what do we know about long COVID? Uh, so long COVID is clearly this, this, this really complex disorder that we understand very little about. And it's uh, uh, a lot of differences around how you define it, how many weeks after infection, uh, whether the, the amount of testing that's required, uh, huge variation and a huge variety of symptoms across the whole spectrum of, uh, of, of medicine, essentially, and this fluctuating time course that's very specific uh, or quite specific for this disorder. Um, do we, you know, uh, uh, are the, 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 the syndromes or the mechanisms and the relevant treatments the same for those who've been in ITU and those who uh, had uh, didn't have COVID severe enough to be admitted to hospital initially? A huge range of mechanisms whether it's vascular, uh, direct virus, post-infectious, para-infectious, and the post-infectious being autoimmune antibodies, uh, and then whether any cognitive process is involved as well. So we also need to put this in context, post-viral syndromes. Uh, a lot is known uh, from SARS and MERS, uh, also a lot from flu, as we mentioned, but also a lot of other viruses, polio, and there's a lot of post-viral syndromes, Ebola, Zika, chikungunya, uh, you know, viruses that many of us in, in, in neuropsychiatry weren't very familiar with, and Danny Altman made me very aware from early days about chikungunya, that it has this sort of chronic uh, severe uh, arthralgia uh, that occurs with it as well. And of course, Epstein-Barr virus uh, as well. Um, so um, the other uh, uh, sort of amazing thing that happened as part of uh, the, the pandemic was that patients sort of started coalescing and forming groups and researching their own symptoms. And this is the patient-led data that if you haven't read, I'd strongly recommend reading. And it was out as a preprint uh, in December 20, but came out uh, in eClinical Medicine in, in July uh, last year. And a huge survey of 300, uh, well, nearly 4,000 uh, patients, mostly non-hospitalized, uh, and uh, with lot many who found chronic disabling symptoms and high rates of fatigue, post-exertional malaise, brain fog, cognitive problems, but also a lot of other neurological problems as well, neurological symptoms and psychiatric symptoms, as I'll briefly outline. Uh, so, and probably, you know, at the time we were sort of thinking that a lot of cardiorespiratory, and of course there is, but it's, uh, I think the sort of the neurological and psychiatric or neuropsychiatric stuff is often at least as problematic, uh, and that's what people are seeing clinically as the enduring disabling symptoms. Uh, so this is just an overview of the comp, but I'd definitely recommend looking at this paper if you can. Uh, but it really gives a huge, in huge detail, the different symptoms that people are reporting. And again, I think this is actually, despite not being a sort of uh, epidemiological sample, it's just an online survey of who, you know, but it's, it's pretty representative, I think, of patients who, who are uh, um, uh, having ongoing dis disability and seen in long COVID clinics. So a huge variety of symptoms. And just to focus on the neurological and the psychiatric. So again, a, a wide, huge variety of different symptoms here found at very high rates uh, across, across all the whole spectrum of brain uh, effects uh, uh, that you might expect. So, so very interesting data, and we, we, we don't quite know how this fits together. This is me trying to put it together into some shape about what maybe the core features, the other physical and the psychological, and, and this is sort of based on putting the symptoms, the common symptoms from that from that paper into some sort of order. But of course, you know, uh, it, the very, very heterogeneous, complex combinations of symptoms people get. So just moving on to another systematic review and meta-analysis the team did, uh, and this uh, came out in Brain Comms um, uh, at the end of last uh, last year. Uh, and again, it's, it's it, you know there's not really any exciting help, but it really just is the way we can crunch the data and really find out what's the the best data we have about uh, about the persistent effects of COVID nineteen uh, on uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms. 
So what do we know about specific mechanisms and disorders? And the short answer is, is not much. And this is an urgent question that needs addressing. And there are tons of studies in the UK, the US and beyond where people are really grappling with this. But I'll just pick out a few just to focus on. Uh, and, and this is probably the one that most of you who followed this will, will have noticed. And this was the large UK biobank uh, imaging study with um, sequential uh, imaging. Uh, that's a study that was already up in a lot of these the great data that's come out is where from studies where people have um, uh, taken existing studies and then just found that people get COVID during it. And then you've got this sort of uh, uh, interesting uh, data that comes out, but really found some sort of uh, potentially some structural imaging changes uh, that occur uh, uh, and particularly link with anosmia, uh, uh, so the smell and taste deficit that people are so common. But of course, whether that's primary or secondary, um, to construct the brain as a plastic organ, it changes the time. So it's, you know, until these things are replicated or done, you know, uh, it's very unclear what's what, what's cause and effect uh, with, with these things. Um, just to focus a bit on uh, neuropathy. So this is very, it's a very interesting uh, small studies that again, these need, need to be replicated more, but um, really some, uh, I won't have time to go through these in detail. I'm doing a whistle stop tour of everything everything today um, and do do uh, Laura do tell me when I've got one or two minutes left so I'll start rattling through things but uh, but these are the uh, small fiber neuropathy uh, uh, papers to date and and this is being recorded so people can go back and pause these and look at them in more detail if they want to but but really some some uh, some evidence that you know the, the standard large fiber stuff that's done on routine testing so but small fiber neuropathy uh, there is some evidence for and there's now now a couple of papers on that um and, uh, and this is a uh, um, um some some more detail from another one of the nih studies really just showing uh, again small numbers uh, just 23 patients um but again we need to sort of just uh just try and get these replicated in large in large samples and see what, what in what proportion of patients this might be relevant and how this might guide treatment of this very chronic disabling condition uh, another quick thing to focus on uh, i was very lucky to go and visit the um Aarhus, uh, in denmark group uh doing a lot of uh, really interesting research in non-covid and professor hatis tans tans Tankizi is a uh, neurophysiologist in, in Nahus, and she's got some interesting data that she's given me some uh, permission to share with you briefly, so I'll rattle through it. But this is a paper that's already published, really just showing some myopathic changes in those with long-term fatigue after COVID-19. Uh, so some quite distinct changes in a proportion. So, of course, again, this needs to be replicated when you see what, whether they, these were typical or representative uh, patients and how this uh, generalises across different uh, sites and settings and clinical populations. Um, but they've also found some... Um, uh, some, some muscle uh, stuff. And this is the stuff that's in press in the European Journal of Neurology. It'll be out very soon. Again, uh, they, they've very kindly given permission. So this is Jane Agagard uh, is the first author on this. So really, again, I'll rat rattle through this. Really some muscle, uh, quite a, in a bit larger study now, uh, really looking and also comparing uh, muscle symptoms with fatigue and some, some differences on EMG in these patients uh, and uh, single fiber EMGs as well. Uh, and then really some correlation between fatigue scores and these uh, EMG scores as well. So perhaps this is linked. And this is something along with the muscle biopsy data where they found some abnormalities. Uh, and this is the summary from the paper, which will be out soon. But I already skipped their conclusions, which is that there's no large fiber neuropathy, but myopathy might be an important cause and it might be sort of linked in with the fatigue side of things. Um, so uh, quite why this is occurring, what the mechanism is and what we can do about it is hard to know. So just finally, I'll just do a very few minutes, if that's OK, Laura, uh, on uh, vaccine uh, complications. So uh, what we know uh, is there's a spectrum of vaccine complications. Thankfully, the vaccine, the, you know, it's one of the miracles of, of, of the pandemic is that the, the science community and the political community really pulled together to rapidly produce effective vaccines, which are not only effective, but the side effects are, or are incredibly low. But given... <clears throat> The scale of uh, millions or billions of people having these uh, these vaccines, thankfully these rates are better, but they are there. And, and obviously the two headlines for people, if you haven't followed this, so that the uh, strokes can occur, especially with venous thrombosis with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and you look out for low platelets, Heidi Dharma, and these specific antibodies that seem to be mediating this perhaps antiplatelet factor four antibodies. Uh, Arena Tamborska, one of Ben's team who works on the blog team as well, has really sort of uh, led the way with looking at Guillain-Barre syndrome. There were some concerns this is quite common, but it seems to be a rare adverse event also with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, there are some other things that were potentially being uh, considered, for, uh, but haven't really turned out to be much of a signal there at the moment. 
Um, so the other thing to flag up is this quite interesting paper, and this pulled together basically all the data from all the vaccine trials uh, and really looked at the rates of complications in the placebo and the vaccine, uh, active vaccine arms. Now, as you'll see here, it's perhaps not surprising for those of us who work in clinical trials that, that adverse events, it's hard to tell whether something is either coincidence, reported it just happened spontaneously, or whether it's placebo or nocebo uh, in this sense, in that uh, if you get the placebo uh, uh, vaccine, you might get a nocebo effect. Um, and this is really you know, quite convincing big data that nocebo is a particular issue. So if you're primed to expect a physical reaction, it like you, th these these things do occur and get reported. So it gets very complicated teasing out what's what's uh, what an effect or not. But sort of um, building on this, it's known that uh, you can get this other type of disorder, which we now know as functional disorders, which can be triggered by vaccines. And this is something that's in in an old parlance is called an immunization stress response. But we know a lot more about what functional disorders are now. It's not a simple stress response. It's much more of a biological process uh, that interacts with stress and it has other risk factors for it, but it's, it's, a, it's really a much more complicated thing that's been neglected by, by science and research and the terminology and the way we look for it, but it has quite specific signs. Um, and Matt Butler and some others, and uh, um, uh, there's uh, trying to, Jan Koberg, a colleague uh, in St George's in London, really found, published the first few cases showing that uh, as the functional disorders can be triggered by uh, so it's not actually caused by the vaccine constituents, it's something about the process of vaccination that triggers this, this other condition. So I probably haven't got time to go through too much more on that, but just to say this is something that's, you know, we don't know how common this is, probably very rare, but we also just know it can happen as, as an alternative explanation uh, uh, for this. And this is our paper which Matt and others put together, Matt Butler, where we sort of linked uh, all the different, how you might distinguish between a, what we call an organic, in other words, there's no real great term to, define, to, to separate these two conditions from a functional uh, reaction. Very briefly, at the end, just to mention the post-COVID core outcome set study. Um, Laura, how much time do I have? Um, or am I over? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, none. <laughs> none. I'll stop there. The only thing I'll quickly do is please, if you're, if you're a long COVID patient um, uh, or a professional, please uh, please uh, uh, take part in our study. We're looking for people's views on what, how we should measure uh, long COVID. So apologies for running over. Sorry. And thanks to the millions of people uh, who've taken part in all these studies and helped out. Thank you. Sorry for everybody. No problem. Thank you. What a comprehensive overview. Um, we've got a lot of questions that come through. I don't think we're going to get through um, most of them. And hopefully that your comprehensive presentation will answer a lot of the questions that have been posed. Um, just a quick signal and um, uh, questions about um, studies um, for, for community people. We obviously have mental health problems um, following COVID and that vaccine as well. And also for children. Um, are there studies out there and um, for direction? With patients? Yes, there are. I mean, um, the, the, the sort of psychiatric disorders, how they interact, because there's, you know, once you've got something that can be caused by the pandemic stress, obviously that suddenly you get a whole other, other mechanism coming in, causing, causing symptoms and, inter you know, like all this disorders, there's an interaction with your vulnerability and the environment. So, so I think um, that's been relatively neglected. There've been some good epidemiological studies about that, but essentially the treatment remains sort of the same, but the major issue is actually getting resources because as people will know, mental health services have been overwhelmed by the demand and already, you know, on the back of, you know, 10, 15 years of austerity and underfunding, you know, for, 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 for psychiatric disorders. So I think that's the problem. Children is a massive problem. Ben's doing some great work uh, with the coroner study. There are some uh, other studies, but I think, again, it's I think it's a neglected thing. And I think there needs to be much more research, both in uh, acute COVID uh, and long COVID, looking at uh, how to uh, diagnose and treat better the, these very disabling conditions. Great. Um, and just a, two questions we're going to try and combine together with regards to risk of COVID and mental health. Does it accentuate people who have an underlying mental health problem? for one example schizophrenia and also on the flip side of this are we seeing this with other infections that not that do not necessarily affect the brain like sepsis yep um so 
yeah, I think it, it does inter. You know, people with a prior history of of, of, of mental health problems clearly do get you know a, you know a relapse often. Uh, we we're, we're, we've now you know it's great that we've managed to get psychiatry involved within the COVID CNS study. So we're looking at psychiatric presentations and how that whether they can occur de novo as it were or whether they're just you know, pre, you know triggered by you know either the stress or the biological effects of the virus or being ill, uh, having a delirium, how that affects the brain. So yes, we're really trying to look into those apologies for the. Um, so yeah, uh, so I think that's that's critical. Sorry, and the second part was sepsis. Are we Sorry? seeing sepsis? Are we seeing these complications? Yes. Of um, so I think the other thing is just that the, the huge number we're seeing of this. So we 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 you know we're picking up small signals in in amongst a huge denominator of of patients we're seeing. Um, so. So sepsis and delirium uh, is the key thing. Um, we're not seeing a huge amount of discrete psychiatric, you know, so psychosis there's a small signal for, but it's not as much as we perhaps feared as yet. Uh, the only other thing just to flag up that's interesting on this, and again, people I work with here are very interested in it, is there is some data from the Spanish flu about perhaps having an infection during pregnancy and how that might lead to a risk of, so we, we also need to think ahead to, to doing studies to look at the potential risk on developing brains uh, as well. So this is not to, you know, without, uh, you know, concerning people, I think there's, you know, there is that, there is some reasonably good, you know, strong data to make sure that we need to look at other mechanisms about how, you know, even in utero, uh, the effects of virus might affect later psychiatric disorders. Yeah, okay. And one last question, dementia. I mean, that's the kind of, you know, memory problems persistent to a, a kind of irreversible um, memory problem. Is, is, is that what we're seeing with COVID-19 or is it too early to say? It's a bit too early to say, but there's, you know, it's clearly a massive problem acutely with delirium. Uh, and, and obviously people might get, you know, uh, memory problems as a complication of stroke but or encephalitis. But um, what we don't know, and I think that signal I have flagged up in that uh, Max Takei's Lancet psychiatry study of that huge data set is that, that there might be a signal for dementia. We don't know. Obviously, that's very, you know, it's very coarse data. But we really need to look at whether, as I mentioned as we went along, that the, whether delirium uh, is... Uh, is something that's set up potentially, um, even though it might be a relatively small increase, but the, given the numbers you've had, you know, severe delirium, and many people on the call who've had COVID will have, might, will have experienced this. Uh, so it's particularly, you know, if you're elderly, but some people quite young get, get a very frank delirium uh, as part of their uh, COVID. So, so I think that's the thing we need to look out for. And I think hopefully it won't be much, but we need to really look into it carefully. And again, you know, we need to do all the right studies to really unpick this and learn, learn from this you know, in terms of how we might prevent or treat uh, cognitive problems with this uh, after COVID. Thank you. And the important thing is the right studies are being done and are gonna start coming through soon. So we should be getting some answers yeah. and, and probably more questions. <laughs> um, but, you know, thank you, um, Ben and Tim, for all your hard work in trying to drive this arena uh, and shed some more light, certainly from a UK contingency. And um, we're all very grateful. Um, so I hope you all enjoy the session. I'm gonna wrap it up now. Um, I, I believe that this will be in, on YouTube in the RSM website, so it can be looked at in the future. Um, thanks to our speakers and for the organisers as well. And just to quickly let you know about an upcoming event, um, Tackling Inequalities Conference on Thursday, the 23rd of June, uh, and Diabetes Conference on Monday, the 11th of July, 2022, this year. All right, thank you all very much. Take care. Bye.